folks, um, if anybody comes, we'll just have to sidle into the back. Thanks for coming for this session. But Christy Kayla, who's going to talk about the new read. So I'm just going to leave Christy and uh, over to you. Thank you. Thank you. So um, my name is Christine Kayla. Um, my background is that I am a librarian. Um, I did my master's some 10 years ago and found out about bibliotherapy, which I'd never heard of before. So it's basically using books or words or text for therapeutic purposes. Um, so this presentation is just about how bibliotherapy can make a difference. And it really so I said it was quite nice when it was what Stephanie was talking about with regard to the Midland View. And it's in a way it's a therapeutic activity. So it's kind of instead of just being like going for a walk, but although you can also argue that's a therapy. I suppose in a way there are clinical applications as well about bibliotherapy. Um, so when I did my research I found that there was various different types of bibliotherapy. So I'm going to mention some of them now. At the moment I'll mention that we read uh, my previous post was as an NHS senior manager in NHS Education for Scotland. So we did some pilots using bibliotherapy across Scotland, uh, various types of bibliotherapy, some clinical, some self-built and some creative. My focus now is creative, so I took early voluntary redundancy um, about three years ago and set up a small community interest company. So it's a social enterprise called We Read and it's using words for well-being, essentially. So, we've well, got too many bits of technology on it. So I've got to do a clicker now. The left, Hello. Let me do it, let me do it. Okay. It wasn't left, it was right. So we read Bibliotherapy in Scotland. When I formed the, interest, the community interest company, it was just like social enterprise, not for profit. Um, I really had a very big motivation and sort of big vision. And I suppose in a way I'm extremely passionate about the value of reading and like I'm a poet as well, so especially creative writing and just, just actually just reading and talking about it. So big bibliotherapy convert. Um, and I wanted to see, you know, you see my wee, my wee website. Um, my vision is to kind of see like small community reading and writing groups on every street corner in Scotland. So, you know, I'll probably be dead and gone at the time if that ever happens. Um, so we are a community interest company. My friend Maureen Fenton is one of my directors on my wee, my wee read board and two others as well. Um, so we provide therapeutic reading and writing services. And see that some of the projects we've been involved in, the CME Mental Health Stigma Campaign, so that was when I was at the Hope, the Hope Cafe, mental health support. Immediately that I sort of started we read, I approached Hope Cafe and said, can I come in and do some writing groups? I was based in Hamilton and Lanarkshire at that time, so they were up for that. And um, so we built up, we had a weekly writing group there, and it was just one of the best things I ever did. So that went on for a few years until Hope Cafe folded in Lanark. Still continued in Stone House. And we also provided the Stone House writing group for a long time as well, with facilitation. At the moment I do the Maggie's Lanarkshire Cancer Care Group, so there's a history of in the whole of the UK, I'm part of a kind of national organisation called Lapidus, Words for Wellbeing. So it's an association of therapeutic writers, um, essentially who practice in, in lots and lots of different settings, Mainly, I've got most often, I suppose, NHS, but very much community as well, and really everybody can do this stuff. Um, and again, going back to what Stephanie was saying about like, her work being what everybody should do, you know, like reading and writing and talking about it is just what everybody does all the time anyway. Um, you're just putting on therapeutic content because you're making it a good activity. So, at Maggie's uh, Lanarkshire Cancer Care, I've been doing that for about two years now, and we have a fantastic and very rewarding. Uh, group there, so I'll talk about them later. But what we do, Rob Leather at Don Keith, that was um, Lothian is actually very good in terms of Scotland for providing some local uh, public library service work in bibliotherapy. They had quite a few of their librarians and library staff, and actually other staff that were the librarians came and get training through uh, <coughs> Lampus, and uh, they do some writing and reading. 
groups, whatever they are. So probably there's something I did for them. And uh, RSN was actually guest the Royal Scottish National Orchestra, and they had a project, it's about, it probably was about 2015, so it's 50 years ago now, and it's a fantastic project which they do every November, so we should be doing one soon. And it's a thing to do with the Scottish Government wanting to set up a particular anniversary in November for remembering our beloved friends who, and family who passed away. So it was called Chaps for Friends that year and I got the opportunity to work with young people in schools and young people from the youth orchestra to, to write and publish a new booklet and perform as well in a concert, their memories and their stories from older people people who died. It's just one of, it's just a beautiful thing. So my work is very lovely, I love my work. Uh, the funding has been totally just like ad hoc, just like small projects for six weeks and bits and bobs, you just do that for three weeks. Um, I've mentioned Lapidus UK and Lapidus Scotland. So they're the kind of people that we draw for training to like mental health nurses. We usually do a weekend every year, right about September, in Gullin, up by North Berwick. Berwick. And it's, it's a beautiful location and it's a great piece of duty training. We read our USP, our unique selling point is that we read and write, where some other bibliotherapists only write or only read. So like UK wide and Lapidus, I would say it's predominantly writers. Um, because I've got a library background, I'm happy to redo stuff. And we'll have a chat about that. So um, yeah. There's a reading project down, it's based in Liverpool University, the reader, and they're trying to, in fact they do, they have spread a bit up north, up to Scotland as well. So at the time I did my research 10 years ago, what I said was, well look, bibliotherapy, it's patchy, it's here and there in the UK, we really need a focused central national organisation that will take it forward, because it's cheap, free, easy, and it works. Um, makes people feel better. So the reader organisation do lots and lots of community reading groups and that is changing people's lives. Um, it's sort of bringing people into the community, more social inclusion, therefore more well-being. Really nice uh, approach. So this is a wee bit now about group sessions, tailored, I, I do agree with just like, whatever group I'm getting into. I think the first group I had was when I was working in Glasgow Addiction Services with the NHS Glasgow, and uh, it was a women's group that had been meeting for about 20 years, alcohol recovery and they met every Wednesday for an activity and some lunch and some chat. And it could be sometimes quite a big group. And most of them were non-readers, the only people that would read a book. Um, but it was interesting when you went under that after a few weeks. Oh, but I read that magazine. Oh, but I read these nice sayings, you know what I mean? So it all came out. And they actually found what a big change it made to their relationships with each other. Their friendships really grew. Because it was like, oh, I didn't know you need to read, read that. Oh, you like the crime over? Oh, that's interesting. Um, so it really opened up stuff for them. Um, so the format is usually about two hours. I'll bring along some stuff, poems that I've selected, or bits of fiction or something that I've brought. Could be non-fiction, it doesn't matter. It's sort of to match themes that might suit that, that particular group. And then we talk about it. So um, after that, we've got a chance to write. And I always make it very informal in the group, so you don't need to write. You know, you don't need to share what you do right. It's just entirely up to the person themselves. Uh, everybody's got different levels of self-confidence with regard to reading and writing. And in particular, sometimes that relates to poetry in school. I mean, I hated, I hated English poetry at school, just because of the way it's taught. But in the way that I do it, it's expressive writing. Whatever you write is right, there are no rules. The only rule is there are no rules. So I do offer a five minute exercise and it's up to them. You can literally sit and write your short list, and that's absolutely fine. But it's something to do with, I mean, there's lots of research being done, which I might talk on, touch on later, that um, the actual act of just lifting a pen and writing so does this thing with the brain where stuff comes out that you're not actually holding in and not expressing. So you can say stuff on paper that you had to say to your peeps, your people. Um, yeah. So there are no rules. What is bibliotherapy? Most people don't know what it is. I know I didn't. So it's the use of language for well-being, talking, reading, writing, watching a film, listening to stories. Anything that really uses text. 
clinical use of books. So many physical and mental therapies use books or reading or reading or on information even as a tool. Um, psychological therapy, cognitive behavioural therapy, using self-help books, often along with a coach and a counsellor or a psychologist. Say it's anxiety. I know I suffered from anxiety for many years. I did CBT with a psychologist and it really, really helped. Um, we read uses creative family therapy. So that's using literature, poetry, writing, reading, story and film. Um, but I was once um, berated for saying that you could do bibliotherapy with a bus ticket. And I was berated because um, people in the reader organisation thought it should be real literature. But I don't agree with that. Because my, my thesis is, or um, that's what I'm saying, my thesis for my MSc was that talking is actually the one essential to make bibliotherapy effective. And it's just face to face. It's just people coming and sitting together and talking about that instead of you know, just sitting alone with books all the same. So we're going to have a bit of practice. So I will read a poem out loud to you and I've got my beautiful assistant will hand out copies for you to read at the same time so you can get a taste of creative bibliotherapy. And why not? End in the room hate poetry. <laughs> this is one of my favourite poems, I, like, I like I enjoy this poem. So I'll read it out loud and then we'll have a wee chat about it. Maybe we might get a wee read if you do like it. So, The Lake Isle of Inishkiri by W.B. Yeats. I will arise and go now, and go to Inishkiri. And a small cabin built there, of clay and wattles made. Nine bean rows will I have there, a hive for the honeybee, and live alone in the bee loud glade. And I shall have some peace there, for peace comes dropping slow. Dropping from the veils of the morning to where the cricket sings. There, midnight's all a glimmer and noon a purple glow. And evening full of the linnet's wings. I will arise and go now, for always day, night and day, I hear lake water lapping with low sounds by the shore. While I stand on the roadway, or on the pavement's grey, I hear it in the deep heart's core. So, mostly in my sessions, which are generally quite small, cosy things, I will say to other people in the group, would you like to read it? I will sometimes go around and read a, another, a verse out loud a second time, because it's always good to have repetition of poetry, because in our normal everyday lives, we don't really walk about thinking like about poems and such, and it kind of takes you to a different place. I don't know, that's what it does to me. Um, yeah, so we would hear it again. So, Maybe you just want to spend a wee minute looking over it and thinking, maybe uh, maybe just if, if anybody has something in there, a line of word that strikes them, that you might like to share that with the group. I was, yes? I was taken with the third line in the second stanza, mm -hmm. the midnight's all a glimmer and the noon a purple glow. Yes. It's evocative in some way. Aye. And both are nice. In some way, mm -hmm. next for the glimmer suggests moonlight. Mm. Or stars twinkling. Yes. The, the mm -hmm. noon of purple glow suggests a kind of mini sky with the sun poking through the clouds. Mm -hmm. Purple glow is quite odd. Mm -hmm. I, I think that it's quite odd to think that at noon there's purple yeah, in the sky, but. but it suggests sun poking through in a stormy cloud or something. Mm -hmm. I definitely. An eerie light, you know. I, well, I, I, I think I'm. Um, 
I mean, again, just the, see that grey, that kind of dark grey that sometimes does go kind of purple, doesn't it? So it's quite interesting. Ooh. Somebody behind, what did you want to say? Yeah, no, I was saying, um, I just like the, actually, the second line about the small cult, uh, cabin built there of clay and water was made. It reminds me of old, old times. You know, yes. the crofters and the, the fields of honeydew and cows and things like that. Yes. Even the honeybees, and you hear the honeybee loud, and it's just the, the gentle hum, hum and buzz of the busy bee, bee workers, because you're not busy, you're calm and relaxed. I like that. Oh, thank you. I think that word waters. It's like it's a, it is an old fashioned word, isn't it? There's something really nice about saying it waters. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like grandma and grandpa. <laughs> Anybody else? Oh, it's the second verse. Um, the, uh, an evening full of the living streams. It's from them. Because the person's obviously sat there and listening to the living wings. How often do we sit every day and listen to the bird's wings? Do you know? That possibility isn't even worth us enough. Normally stressful days. Anybody else? If, even if you didn't know it was Yeats, you'd know the person was a master of the language because there's so much expressed, but they're not reaching for any complicated descriptors at any point. It's like you, a, a child could understand the words that are used, and yet it's expressing stuff that's actually quite complex. So I really, that's about that was something that I really appreciated. You know? Thank you. Yeah, I think there's actually been, I mean, I've actually read other poets talking about this poem and how structurally his rhythms and syllables and what noise, you know, do something, just in the way that Shakespeare did with his 12 syllable, blah, 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 blah. And, um, yeah. There's that technique that he reverses the English because English, the language so few of rules I just did it myself. That you know, a small cabin built there rather than they, you know, uh, build a small cabin there. You know, he's, uh, linguistically, that's clever. The next, the next half of that of clay and bottles made, not made of clay and bottles. You know, exactly. And, and he does it later on as well. It's really, it's really uh, that, it, it makes you, it makes you process a story. I was just going to say, it yeah. feels like somebody's telling you a story. There's also an element of song. Mm -hmm. the rhythm. There's the, you know, the does going da, ba, da, made honeybee, glade, you know, it's, yeah, there's a resonance that, uh, I don't think you could do it by formula, but he certainly knows how to do it. So, would you like a chance to have a wee writing exercise for five minutes? Mm -hmm. Yeah, go on. <laughs> well, yeah, I don't, um, there might be enough, hopefully. Yeah, pens and paper, anybody? I've got some posters and pens here. and then I'll give you five minutes and just write whatever comes. Don't judge it, don't stop it. If you get stuck, um, you just repeat the same word again that you've just written. Just keep writing. And the action of writing the pen on paper will do something with the brain to allow connections to be made. So just freely writing anything that enters your mind. Write whatever you like. Keep the pen moving. 
whatever you write is right. Stop. Just repeat the, the last word that you wrote. Keep repeating that again and again if you need to. Don't worry about spelling and grammar. Eleven or so. You're only doing that for yourself. You don't need to read it out or anything. Anything you'd like to share? Well, I'd gladly read it because I know um, uh, 
poetical literary knowledge and I'm glad you said grammar and um, phrasing and syntax can be errors. So, um, so you started with I hear the late water laughing, moving the stones and such shoreside shale banks, forever changing the images that pass before my consciousness. Being here calms my thoughts, breath and very being. Such peacefulness seems such a guilty indulgence, the pace of the waves slower than the pace of my heart. And I would like to stay and indulge some more. Oh. Mm -hmm. So if there's any mental health nurses in the room, do they think that it might be useful to have this as an activity for some of the people in the wards? Because um, Donna, who set up the whole cafe in Larnac, where I worked for a couple of years um, as a volunteer, was convinced that having a who she had worked previously would have been such a great help. I mean, she did actually do it herself for a while, but what we need next is to actually get writers going into wards <laughs> and NHS. And I, I was really keen to do that actually, but it never quite uh, materialised. But yeah, working with people in, in the group in Wokapi, and Morin had come one time because we did a six week course, which we got money from CME um, to do a kind of focused anti mental health stigma course with it for the writing group. And it was fantastic, it wasn't it, Maureen? Remember that last day? So we had, I mean, it was a tiny wee cafe. I don't know if anybody's ever went to the book cafe. Fantastic. So we were in the wee room, and the wagon was about 13 of us around the table. And for the past few weeks, we'd been writing, you know, so I would bring some, like, maybe empowering poems, like, say, My Angelou, and um, some of our standing up poems, and still our eyes, and whatever and talking about what stigma is and how it's society that gives you that label and talk about identity and loss of identity. Um, and some of the people in the group had quite severe uh, mental illness. So what we'd done is we'd all written various pieces and then we made a combined poem uh, which also had a bit of a hip hop beat because one of them was a big Eminem fan. And uh, <laughs> so we did, an, we did a, a hip hop um, Renga, and it's something that a lot of writers use in the groups to do Renga. This was a line of mine, a line of yours, a line of yours, and then we could run to a line to a beat, and it was just fantastic, wasn't it? I wish I'd have recorded it in a video group, you know, because it's one of those ones that will never happen again. And it was so good. It was so satisfying. It was like, I think by the end of the day, we were all out quite loud and lifting the roof. Um, but basically, the feedback that I've heard from everybody that I've ever had in writing groups. And reading groups is that it just really makes them feel better and they get to confidence and they get to make friendships and it's all this normal, easy, easy everyday stuff that people just I was taking rise to. I, I was thinking when I wrote there to, to, to write around relaxing. Mm. Um, I didn't plan to do that because I didn't know I was going to be doing it. But then but, but, the, the words that I used, sedate, abate, you know, the, um, uh, you know, and they were about relaxing down, and it sounds like a peaceful place initially, oh, you know, and yeah. uh, and so uh, and the subtext is this is a conference, so maybe I was thinking about using this to relax, but I, I didn't consciously think about it that way. But that's, that's a good interesting. Thing. It's, it's good that you can just arrive there. So I've got more stuff to read. So Biblio Poetry Therapy in America, and a lot of this does come from research, but it's still the same today. So in America there's a National Poetry Therapy Association and they do give you like a qualification. 
in Britain, we don't have any qualified bibliotherapists. We just get people like me that are just doing it. Um, in fact, some people in Britain have took the National Poetry Therapy qualification. So, Lapidus UK, which has now actually become international, I should say, is starting to look at the possibility of making it, you know, a bit more like an arts therapy, you know, with painting, the art therapy, and music therapy. But there's a whole, there's a whole lot of stuff going on there because a lot of the people who facilitate writing groups are poets or writers, and they're sort of artistic and they're not really, they don't want to be clinical, they don't want to do evaluation and stuff like that. Um, but it's, in a way, I was quite fortunate because when I was doing my NHS pilots, it was like they had to be evaluated, um, and again, like any work that you seek to do an improvement in mental health in NHS, look at sure the financial benefits of, you know, etc, etc. Quite glad to have left that behind. Um, so at the Poetry Pharmacy, now this just happens to be, there's loads and loads of stuff out there if anybody's interested on the internet. There's loads of people doing this work. The Poetry Pharmacy is just a recent book that's come out, tried and true prescriptions for the heart, mind and soul. A new book by William C. Hart, is a biblio poetry therapist. So some of the therapists in the creative side would be the counsellors or you know, psychologists, I don't know, that, and they will use fiction, even novels. But he's, he's a poetry, he uses poetry. And one of his quotes is, a thought which you had, you, you had thought special and particular to you is set down by someone else. A person you've never met, someone even who's long dead, and it's as if a hand has come out and taken yours. You know, and it gives you that feeling of, oh, I am not alone. And of course, that benefit of being in a group and chatting with people who have also had severe problems, the same as you. You know, Maggie's cancer care, somebody who's had cancer, who's survived, somebody who's got cancer, who has anyone who's survived. Being able to talk, being able to write about the deep things in life. Poets talk about the deep things. So this is something that William Seacar also says when he had a kind of eureka moment. Um, while poetry had been his friend from a young age, one particular experience in his mid-twenties proved to be a light bulb moment. A man was hit by a car in front of him on the Cromwell Road in London. He helped save this man's life and watched him being taken away in an ambulance. He was left standing with blood on his hands and a poem in his head, Philip Larkin's Ambulances, which talks about the moment when one sees an ambulance in the street. Poor soul, they whisper at their own distress. Those words in the large gin and tonic he'd had at the pub, the combination of those two started to make me think I can make sense of this. He wanted to bring poetry out from its hidden corner kind of thing, and I suppose I feel the same way, because I've been writing poetry since I was what, about 10 or something. And, uh, and it's great to be able to bring poems to people and, and read stuff out to people and, and bring something new. But there's a lot of evidence for writing therapy. So James Pennebaker, who's a US person, I mean, he's done so much research. You'll find like pages and pages and pages of his stuff. Um, so he says, writing about emotional upheavals in our lives can improve physical and mental health. There are probably a thousand ways to write that may be beneficial to you. We can all talk, read, write, or watch a film. Talking in a way that can be helpful can be fired up by deep emotional literature. You can do it too. Take it to your patients. I hope mental, nurse, mental health nurses can bring a focus to this type of work in Scotland over the next 70 years. So, like that, and now previous session with uh, Stephanie talking about with them you, you know, I would love to offer to do them a wee uh, taster session for reading and writing for her group, but I'll go anywhere. <laughs> reading therapeutically, so slightly different bias in terms of uh, using a book or a text for a specific problem. So there's there's various examples and there's loads of clinical practice that you find in the you know, like I used to work with knowledge services and NHS education, so it was electronic library, the knowledge. Um, so it could be it could be a physical symptom, you know, that they use a specific text to help that person and that, that illness. 
like CBT for self-help, coaching with someone to change behaviours, the use of films about addictive behaviour to learn how to talk about and explore one's own addictions. I know that's something that they use in Glasgow Addiction Services um, in one of their more therapeutic settings. And we also had, that was a US example, when we have offenders who have been prescribed a literature course instead of a jail sentence. And these are directly using novels or stories about the crime itself, usually a hard offence like rape or murder. So a lot of these guys that were offered the chance to buy a judge, it was a judge who initiated the whole system, and they offered them the chance to either have a jail sentence or a literature course at a local college, at which he would, the judge attended, you know, one of the prison officers attended and another person and, you know, about 10 other uh, serious offenders. And they would literally read a novel together about a violent assault. And I know one of the guys, I was very, very moved when I read this research, and one of the offenders who had done a very serious uh, physical assault said, oh, I never thought how the victim would feel. Never ever thought about that. Didn't know how to empathise. And uh, the results of that one was that, I think there was an 80 pen, 80% 80 uh, improvement in these in these guys not reoffending. If you know what I'm saying, they didn't, 80% of them did not reoffend. You know what I mean? You're changing the heart and mind. You're not, do you know what I mean? You're not just locking a door on them. So that's one of my favorite ones, I love them. They did actually come to Britain do a bit in, Sussex, that, that particular scheme. There's lots and lots going on in terms of books and therapy and stories, and it's not just poetry, it's not just reading. So books and stories, we know we all create our own, create our own stories about ourselves. Um, that's, what, that's what we manage to get by in life. We, we make up our own stories, we create a, a construct around our experience. We tell each other stories about ourselves all the time. Some people need to hear the right stories. You know, if they've had difficult stories told to them when they were young and they, they just don't know how to get out of that story, so they need to, they need some coaching and some help how to get a different story and get rid of the old stories. And for me personally, I think that's something that we all do all the time in life. That's what it's all about. Uh, solo reading, just for leisure, but much more as well. I mean, reading is good for you. One of the guys that I found in my research was. Uh, Mr. Gold, whose first name I've forgotten already, it'll come at me, and his book was called Read for Your Life, and basically he just believes that, you know, if you don't read, you are not going to have a healthy life. So, but I suppose in a way it doesn't need to really be fixed to reading a book, um, but it's to do with having that kind of input and, that, and also the kind of chat about what life means to you, I suppose. So, oh, let's go. Um, but reading and identifying with a character in a novel, you know, they've done uh, research to show how if you empathise and identify with a character, then you can learn how to empathise. Um, and it may be essential for human imaginal growth. I mean, personally, I know that from my two kids and my four granddaughters, they all love a story. They all love books. Because you can escape there. And you can think things that nobody's telling you don't think that. You know, wonderful. Transformative storytelling is one of my most favourite things because I've personally benefited from that. So there are some storytellers who have gained these incredible skills um, to help challenge your own story so that you can change your own life. Um, one of the techniques that you use this Greek drama chorus, I don't know if everyone knows what I'm talking about. Say I told you the story about when I was in a fire and you three decided that you would give me a line back from what I've just said and it's got a huge impact. It's really transformative the world. Um, so there's a growth now in terms of stories being used to heal large groups. For example, restorative stories in Ireland and Northern Ireland, uh, Palestine between the Jewish and Arab communities, and also corporate organisation using stories just to effect change within organisations. Because again, like that, you know, cor corporate bodies tell themselves stories that, that need to change. I've got a link up there for Michael Williams, who's a storyteller from Canada. He has lived in Scotland for a long time, but he's going back. And there's a video link there. Now, this will go online that you can click in and see. It's fantastic. I did some one-to-one -one training with him. 
uh, a few years ago. And he's the guy that does the Transformers storytelling and went to Palestine. I've got a hand out here with some of the sources, extra perhaps organisations that you might be interested in, and look at my website too. So I think that's about us. I just want to say, you know, thanks for letting me come at the conference. There's pockets of bibliotherapy in Scotland, but it's not kind of focused. Uh, there's no funding, and it's a shame because it's so cheap and easy. But I just hope that, you know, your shelves will go away and talk about it and maybe start getting a wee writing group together and approach myself or Lapidus to give you a writer to come to your sessions. Thank you. Thank you, Kathy. Thank you.